it takes a lot of self prep and, and sort of uh, initiation to get to that point of acceptance. It was not until we did this pop up thing that I just kind of like threw it to the wind and said, you know, this is this is what the concept is. Dubai is either going to bite or not. I mean, if you look at it from a broader, like, long term perspective, who would ever think that combination would ever work? From Amaya FM, I'm Chirag Desai, and you're listening to Tales of the Trade. To conclude our special summer season today, we bring you a Bonanza episode, featuring not one, but two startups who are closely entwined in their operations and their personal journeys. So pull up a chair and join our conversation with two entrepreneurs who came together to create a special blend of art and food. This is the tale of two pop-ups. A couple of years ago, two young men were at the offices of Deloitte and Touche, chatting regularly during their breaks about everything under the sun. Emmet Kadim and Justin Joseph were financial advisors, consultants, basically those numbers guys. And the boys had two things in common, the desire to do something on their own and their insatiable love for chai. So in 2016, after leaving the cushy world of consulting, they decided to go back to their roots, pun intended, and travel to India's glorious tea regions. So we went to West Bengal, to Darjeeling, etc., understanding how the whole tea process is. And then we went to the streets of um, Calcutta and drinking endless amounts of chai just to distinguish which one works best and the most authentic one. And we captured that journey. So this is all in the name of research. You were drinking chai. Bit of both. <laughs> what we've done is later on, because we had uh, our own solo trips to India, so... We, we moved throughout different parts of India, Mumbai, Delhi, West Bengal. So the main parts besides the south. So we got a fair uh, amount of information and idea of what we want to do. So essentially what Chaiwara does, Project Chaiwara is, it's a street side chai concept from the streets of South Asia into a, an urban city like Dubai. And what we've done is we've kept the same exact recipe in that pot, just hygienically cleaner and uh, under a concise brand that appeals to uh, the masses. And the idea is to have your neighborhood chawal in every spot you go around the world. So, I mean, starting with Dubai as a homegrown concept, because we're both um, from Dubai and we wanted to start something from Dubai itself rather than franchising. What was the point for you where you said, this is actually a viable business, let's do this, versus this is a fun idea. We talk about it every time we sit down for chai and then you just walk away from it, which is what happens a lot. I always had an entrepreneurship in my blood. I mean, coming from my family as well. Uh, especially my grandfather were like merchants and traders uh, between India and Dubai, coincidentally. I was always on the back of my head to eventually leave the corporate world or, uh, and start my own thing. Mainly to start my own thing, not just to leave the corporate world. Obviously, after taking that trip to India was the game changer for us because we were prepping for the next event season in Dubai. So I would definitely say the trip in India gave us further knowledge and uh, the confidence to launch this. Although, although the challenge, the biggest challenge there is you're testing an authentic product that is done differently in Dubai, except at homes. I mean, you, uh, what's your experience of chai in Dubai? It's honking the horn in a cafeteria and getting rainbow chai, which is non-existent in South Asia anyway. And the price point. I mean, we're talking about a 12 dirham karak which is at the caliber of the uh, international cafes, right? That was our biggest concern, I would say. Did you guys work out numbers at that stage? Or did you just say, look, this was a good idea, let's go and then let's see what happens? No, no, it wasn't a numbers game initially. It was just uh, understanding the concept. And then eventually, I mean, we were both uh, like financial advisors. To be very frank, it's a totally different industry than what you look at in your presentations. Because once you do it yourself, it's a different ball game, and then you try to reduce as much as you can. You're a startup, you want to bootstrap, etc. So the consultant's world is, I mean, you learn a lot, and there's a lot of, but there's a lot of love around it as well, right? Once you go down to the ground, this is where the real talks <laughs> happen. And so solid concept in one hand, and of course, chai in the other. For about a year and a half, the team behind Project Chaiwala strategically took their kettles to pop-up events around the city. That was our testing phase, so, so we invested, obviously, a fair amount of money into building a brand in it from day one. That's why you see the kettle that was always there, and, uh, and the name. Um, and then we just want to see people's perception to it. And, and s thankfully, it was a success from day one um, in terms of attracting people to the stall or to the kiosk. 
because it's that, there, that experiential part which people don't have over here with chai, which is a chai, chai, chai chant, and the one meets a chai. So it grabbed a lot of eyes So uh, during Dubai Food Festival at Beach Canteen. We didn't do all events in Dubai. We, we selected them. So we did Beach Canteen, we did Market OTB, we did Seoul DXB. They were all strategic because they either had the right uh, spending power, the right target market, and um, people that were also understand and be conscious and aware of the brand there that's in the market right now or that's entering the market. I mean, that's our biggest testing point, right? It's the people we're going to and whether, how they perceive it. We did at least 20 events um, throughout the two years. Obviously, you guys have been working together now two plus years. Uh, what, what's that been like? It's, uh, it's been great, actually. Um, it's uh, interesting working with somebody else because um, like if you're 100% in tune, with everything, that means you you just gave up 50% of equity or whatnot to another person. So they say you should never get a co-founder, any co-founder that thinks exactly like you. It's definitely a plus to have a co-founder because it gives you another perspective of, uh, of things. And I think we our brand, the long-term vision is aligned, but we have different skill sets that we add to the table. It wasn't defined and set in stone that you're going to do X, I'm going to do Y. We, do, we both don't have technical knowledge of the industry, right? I mean, at this stage, yes, it, it is more defined, obviously, what, what skill sets we add to the table, what our roles are. Pre-conceptualization uh, and during that period, it was more of a discussion and putting it down on paper and then dividing the roles and, and actually looking at the strengths of each to say, you work better here, you work better there. And, and things ch change along the way. But you can imagine two guys in a tea garden in the middle of Darjeeling. It's pitch dark. I mean, at night you're sitting, uh, staying in a tea garden home and with, n with no nobody around you. TV barely works. So, <laughs> so a lot of thought went to the, like those nights because we sat down and we, we discussed the ideas and what, what sort of stuff we need and how to bring it to, 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 to a starting point. I think it's extremely crucial to have respect and maturity in the equation with, uh, with your co-founders. It's always taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. It's a discussion where we don't, we're not aligned. We just take a step back and take a breather and then decide. So locations are a discussion, an ongoing discussion, right? Uh, it's not like we're 10 stores into it and then whoever is running as MD can decide and just open the 11th store, right? We're not systematic, I would say, but we're kind of, we try to break it into like formulas, right? What makes a su successful location? What makes a successful brand? What makes a successful partner, stakeholder, supplier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you, we rate them. So what happens that if we score, on, let's say, an eight out of 10 collectively on that particular topic, then I can't put my ego on the table and say, no, we're not doing it. And he can't do either, or wh whoever can do either. This knowledge of putting this, these formulas together ha have come through uh, understanding and research. It's, it hasn't come out of the blue. So we try to implement this where, wherever we can, uh, and that makes the interaction much more mature. That's pretty good, actually. Let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not jinx it up. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I'm just winging it, you know? Now, around the time that Project Chaiwala was gaining traction through pop-ups, another venture was working through a similar approach. A nomadic cinema, sourcing independent movies and showcasing them across the city. <laughs> Not really. Like, it's kind of this very strange cusp of, like, you know, deep meditation and, you know, a lot of calculation and a lot of chance and, you know, and, and intuition. <laughs> yeah. Buthena Kadim is the co-founder of Cinema Akio, Dubai's first art house cinema. And her involvement with indie films spends most of her adult life, going back to 2008. The project I was working on was called Scene TV, and it was sort of a some hybrid of ZDF, Arte, um, Channel 4, some programming, uh, Sundance, IFC, you know, all these different channels kind of all together, but made for the region, made for the Arab world. It was almost like this magical inclination to, you know, to to present all this content to 360 million viewers around the Arab world, but also seeing, you know, 
an accurate or even more authentic or heartfelt or layered versions of you know of our part of the world the other thing the other sort of pillar you know that that i sort of was operating on that led to the creation of a space like this is the importance of having you know a uh, a linchpin to a larger conversation or multiple conversations that were motivated by you know the, the idea of consciousness raising of you know of building awareness around different things around critical thinking around you know debate and these were things that were not you know part of the day-to-day experience of a city like dubai Cinema Akil also tested out their idea through pop-up screenings of exclusive or indie movies that showcase the region in a way that the mainstream didn't. So the first pop-up was in July 2014, um, and it was a collaboration with Third Line Gallery. Another, another one of those like kind of like hopeless, deflated summer lulls that lead to a lot of creative production. I think as part of the Dubai experience, like bored summer children that would not go home, and they would get up to like all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot more, obviously, a lot more uh, deliberate and thought out conceptually. But, you know, it's it, interesting things happen at times where you assume there would be no traction. Um, so, you know, they were willing to experiment. And I was at that point really interested in continuing the presentation of uh, art house films and documentaries and, you know, alternative content, um, even in the microscopic sort of space of, you know, a gallery in al in Dubai in the summer. Was it you just thinking, well, okay, look, this is something I'm really passionate about. Let me see if I can collaborate with someone. Or were you thinking, this is what I'm going to do with my life? No, the end was always in sight. At that point, the end, that's why we had it, We had a name. You know, that's why at that point, it was Cinema Kiel series at the Third Line Gallery. It was always the thing that I was going to do. Because, I mean, the long story of, of sort of how I ended up doing, you know, focusing on art house content from the broadcast sort of sp- sphere, you know, and the, and the subsequent financial disaster... Uh, you know, and the cancellation of a lot of, you know, media endeavors and projects. Um, you know, I was sitting there with all these contacts and this huge network of, you know, of distributors, sales agents, rights holders to all this, these films and nothing to do with them. There was no more, you know, TV channel that I could put them on. So I started personally reaching out out of frustration to, you know, the rights holders of some of these great films um, and, and asking for permission to showcase them publicly. Today's Cinema Akil is housed at al Sarkal Avenue, a cultural district based out of al Yes, we're in al again. The cinema is stuck away in an almost serene corner of the avenue. The walls are adorned with movie posters from the 80s and 90s, and the dark wallpaper with damask designs reminds you of where you are. And unlike any cinema hall you've been to, almost covering an entire wall is a large window. The window has become this sort of, you know, this this look into the world. And there was something very uh, unsettling about opening a cinema, an art house cinema that was supposed to be, you know, outward looking, public facing, you know, democratic, accessible, all of that stuff in a space like Sarkal where we wouldn't be facing the street. You know, there was something very essential about having access to the street, even though it's limited right now. Like we only have the fire exit uh, space, but we have this gigantic window, which, you know, I, I, I'm actually very proud of as a as a happy kind of coincidence, because I think we're the only one, the only cinemas of all the cinemas that I've seen, um, you know, in my research sort of phase for this space, uh, you know, that actually has an embedded permanent uh, window as part of the the day to day experience of it, which you know acoustically is not the easiest thing to 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 grapple with because you know we had to doctor all kinds of you know custom solutions, but we are in Dubai. A lot of you know everything is pretty much custom. Yeah, that's the only way. <laughs> so we had a guy who knew a guy who was able to to find us a solution. Which is also a Dubai thing that I know, had a guy who knew a guy. That's exactly what I'm <laughs> referencing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a window, but then the window looks over our first pop-up as Cinema Kiel. The greatest thing about being here in Al-Surakal and, you know, working with partners like them is that they're willing to try things out. And, you know, we threw out our other partners. We procured the equipment that we would need to run. There was already a barcode projector, a cinema grade projector that we were we, had, we were using for the outdoor screening. So we had all these basic sort of, you know, skeletal uh, elements in place. It was the first time that we actually saw um, what that would look like on a day-to-day basis, people's response to it, their movement through it, their expectation even of what an art house would look like. Uh, we worked with these two artists, Chindi and Sheb Moha, uh, to come up with the concept of what the space would look like. So these wallpapers that you see around us, I mean, that's uh, some that's that's left over from that concept. Uh, you know, we had gone through at that point four architects um, and several contractors. Decided at that point to strip it down to the basics. Decided to say, you know, what is the the essential experience? What is the space going to offer? 
um, you know, and 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 part of it was the was the FNB. Initially, the cinema thought of having an almost nostalgic corner store concept, with simple things like chips and juice packs, similar to the way we had them growing up in the city in the eighties and nineties. That little bacala or grocery store where you got your chips oman or your orige or caprison juice packets. You know, we had the snacks and we had you know the elements of of the of the corner store with products that you would only find in corner stores here. So everybody, that, every every Dubai kid or Sharjah kid would, you know, recognize the specific things that we'd, we'd put in there. And then there were some things that were wild cards that we just wanted to experiment with, like the cereal boxes instead of chips. Like, you just open a tiny cereal box, yeah. I mean, I do that all the time. I thought maybe other people would get on board. It was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so we killed it. By 2017, the two stories had already begun converging. Cinema Akil and Project Chaiwala had collaborated during their pop-up days, resulting in those winter screenings with a hot cup of chai. And so when their initial ideas didn't quite pan out, Cinema Akil turned to their former collaborators and asked Project Chaiwala if they would like to open a special flagship store in partnership with them. And this is what we see today. Now, if the well-timed convergence of these two tales wasn't freaky enough for you, there's another small detail that might just tip the scale. The two respective founders of Project Chaiwala and Cinema Akil that we've been speaking to today also happen to be siblings. More on that after the break. Support for the show comes from Declutter Me, a branded podcast in partnership with Amaya FM, talking about organizing and decluttering your life with your host, Shalina Jokia. Hi, Shirag. So what's been your favorite episode? My favorite episode has to be uh, the Swedish death cleaning episode. Yeah, not a, lot, not a lot of people may know what Swedish death cleaning is, though. No, they won't. And they'll have to listen to the podcast to find out more. But yeah, interesting topic and very relevant for families and friends. You can listen to Declutter Me in your favorite podcast player. You can listen to it in the same one you're listening to this ad right now, as well as in streaming apps like Spotify. Anangami. For more information, visit declutterme.com slash podcast. Feel like your favorite platforms have become a place for toxicity and fake lifestyles? We invite you to listen to CSR of One, a podcast that explores the proactive side of social media. In a world full of selfies, we challenge you to do more. Do something. Help someone. Use your place in the world for those who don't have a voice. The first season of CSR of One is now live wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. You're listening to the season finale of Tales of the Trade with our guest Emmet Kadim from Project Chaiwala and Butena Kadim from Cinema Akio. When the siblings decided that their two independent paths had converged to formulate this interesting partnership, they had to look for that opportunity within the challenge. The challenge of how the Chaiwala brand and the cinema brand would actually come together. We have this like kangaroo effect, you know, is putting one brand in the other, you know, and, and just trying to figure out how they would coexist design wise, spatially, the flow, uh, the setup, the experience, what food we would develop. That was where it got a little bit like, you know, a little bit tense, rough a little water, bit rough. Rough water. <laughs> More specifically, the nachos. <laughs> <That's what Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nachos. You think this taken for granted movie snack wouldn't be the basis of heated debate when setting up a cinema, but neither sibling really wanted to pick up the question. Do you think you, you yeah, got? I leave the mic there because uh huh. Yeah, you gotta take this one. <laughs> I mean, it was just like in the development phase of the menu, right? What are we gonna serve? Because what we served in summer 2017 was totally different than what, what we're doing in 2018. Because right now we've also matured as a brand, and what our offering would be is completely different than summer 2017. So. Cinema Akil insisted on having nachos, uh, flavored nachos, given that we're a desi concept, like a puri style. So like, you know, just some uh, either puri on top and like in desi. Like a desi twist on nachos, as opposed to those Tex-Mex sort of fr- So we, we set up for, for popcorn. <laughs> popcorn no, we, was we always tried, no, We actually happy. tried it. We didn't think that this would serve our brand well, even though... It's a cinema, et cetera, but we thought that, okay, we're focusing more on chai and p- chai pairing, uh, whatever our menu has a chai toast, sm- smash mosa. So it just goes hand in hand with chai. Nachos is a bit different, popcorn as well. So um, popcorn is a given, I think, with the cinema nachos, maybe not so much. So the kind of the um, disagreement happened there. So so it was a back and forth discussion with them until we, we said, you know what, let's just try it and see if it works or not. But we did tastings. 
but operationally we, we couldn't pull it off anyway so that was the thing about it right is that as much as like in theory you know uh, the idea of like desi nachos was compelling when you actually test it out operationally when you test it out you know even from a like a flavor point of view it wasn't exactly you know so we we we, we had enough uh, enough resilience to accept, admit defeat <laughs> you know on the nachos we gave up the nachos and we settled for this mashmosas instead which was you know which was a big which has been a big hit and turned to be this like brand uh, you know Signature. concepts uh, that they've developed and uh, it serves the idea of easy dining and you know and cinema dining very very well and that was kind of the thinking that had to be manipulated or you know or adjusted to the cinema experience is how do you serve this kind of food while making it um, you know cinema friendly something that's easy to consume while you're watching while you're in the dark you're watching films and you know and and keep the space relatively you know sanitary uh, throughout so I mean it was a lot of fun it was a lot of tasting it was a lot of good food and a lot of you know failed uh, failed experiments um, and you know, chai along the way. I think they've been respective and uh, and appreciative of, and we've been as well to their contribution to Chaiwala as a starting point. I mean, if you look at it from a broader, like long-term perspective, if you're looking at the first flagship of what was open in art house cinema, like, who would ever think that combination would ever work or even why in art house cinema, but it's distinctive in its own, right? The area over there is mainly Chaiwala inspired by cinema. That's what people are just mesmerized when they come. It's like, what's happening over here? And, and, and the setup of the cafe is pretty cozy. It's more European, I would say, right? It gets a bit too tight when there's a, a rush hour with the movies. But that's the charm of being here, I guess. And it's attracting it. It's like if you go into Cannes Film Festival, she was just there. She had to wait an hour before an 8 a.m. movie. And people would say, oh, it's not convenient. But that's part of the charm, right? Design wise, it was something that was like, I think it was actually a very happy accident. You know, we ended up with, you know, a color palette that we had not originally, uh, you know, foreseen or even designed. Uh, the Project Chaiwala Green and the red of the cinema and the imposing red and decisions to keep that were things that we were like iterating along the way. And I think that, you know, the, the beauty of this is that it's always going to be the original. It's always going to be sort of the flagship. There will be no other concept that will look like it. It was all about this accident, this coming together, this merging, this clash sometimes of, uh, of ideas and worlds, the, the, the areas of contention, uh, if you will. How Chaiwala like, friendly or how Chaiwala uh, accurate uh, would it be? You know, so there was this kind of constant uh, dance that we had to... <laughs> We had to do to figure it out. I'll stick to dance. <laughs> there are many versions of dances. <laughs> this is the podcast version. <laughs> and so forged the collaboration of the flagship location for both Cinema Akil and Project Chaiwala. Both companies tweaked, twisted, and slightly turned together. But in the end, as you walk past the box office today, strolling through the narrow corridor towards the cinema, you can't help but smile as you smell the chai and watch the enterprising chaiwalas tackle those big kettles with ease as they bring their tea to a repeated boil. And although the path to the present day has been a meandering one, Cinema Akil, much like the films it shows, has undoubtedly gained cult status in the art scene in the region. I always say, like, you know, the operation of an art house cinema sits on the convergence point of, uh, of like, sheer, you know, romantic poetry, and uh, and 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 ruthless ruthless pragmatism. It's this very ugly kind of beautiful situation. The two things are not supposed. They're not compatible with each other. They shouldn't be. But then they they work together. They, that's that's how you end up with the delivery of a space. It's the sort of harshness of you know the industry and the box office and all the different mechanics that go into it, the technicality, and then the poetry that you actually that changes your life. You know through the silver screen. In the last six, eight months, you have a little hindsight behind you. Like, well, technically hindsight is behind you, but like... By design. By design. <laughs> <laughs> would you look back and say you would have done something differently? You know, my answer is not going to be very romantic because it's a very technical kind of uh, rethinking of it. And I think I would have added another screen from the get-go. That's my biggest kind of, not a regret, but my, my biggest realization. Programmatically speaking, it would have changed the way that we do things. It would have changed the program itself. It would have changed the windows of release for films that we would show, um, you know, our decisions on what to keep and what to remove, how we program the space. We don't have any of that flexibility right now with the single screen. So um, that was something that, you know, I had thought about and, you know, and in 
you know, as a byproduct of all these different sort of challenges and and the need to deliver. I think um, of you know the, very, the longest gestation period for an art house cinema. Uh, you know, we got to we got to the point of of of, of you know the crisis point of of having to open the space. You know, and 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 personally speaking, having done it long enough. Uh, you know, wanting to put it, uh, you know, out in the world and actually to stress test it and go and go through the experience that I had imagined, you know, all these years uh, would, you know, would come to life. And as for Project Chaiwala, they're now hard at work beyond the flagship and on the verge of opening their first independent location and their neighborhood Chaiwala concept is set to open in a few weeks. And as we slowly but surely move into an era where companies giving back is an essential part of their culture, Justin and Ahmed have done this by building philanthropy into the core of their idea right from the very beginning. We have embedded in our culture to give back, whether it's through like charity or zakat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's the betterment of the society, right? Not just your pocket. So that's where project came from. And then, if you want to split it up into two categories, it's uh, directly and indirectly. Indirectly is basically the stakeholders, which could be sourcing organic fair trade tea, sourcing sustainable and compostable packaging as much as we can. We're not 100%, but we're trying to, 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 to be there. Sourcing clay cups, the Kullar, a company, a supply that supports women empowerment within India as well. So that's your indirect contribution. And, and the betterment of our chaiwalas, which is number one. And then directly is, is dedicating a portion into uh, charitable contributions, which where we think fit. With a concept like, like ours, selling chai for 10, 12 dirhams, doesn't really uh, hit the bottom line so, uh, I mean, enormously, right? You need to have scale and multiple stores, probably hundreds of stores to have an actual impact. Then you can build the school or like water sanitation, etc. Or is that what you want to be able to drive? Oh, definitely. It's something we're looking into, but I wouldn't say we're fixated on that, but we want to see the impact with our contributions and our, our, our customers' contributions, technically, I mean, somehow into into that. So that's why I say it's a, it's a project you're building as well as a... It's a smile you put on people's faces uh, and customers and even the chaiwalas through interaction. And it's also the impact you have in, literally on people's lives somewhere completely, uh, let's say halfway across the world, right? And it's because of your uh, consumption of chai. It's not because of anything else, right? Now you've been an entrepreneur for two years. How, how does that feel? Uh, great. I'd rather sell chai than prepare a presentation. <laughs> but don't you have to prepare presentations to sell chai? Yeah, but then it's my... Chai presentation. <laughs> it, it's definitely been an interesting journey, challenging as well. Given our background, we also predicted these things, so w- which give us a cushion and it didn't catch us off guard. Oddly enough, it's exactly what I wanted it to be. There are days that are deflating. There are days that are, you know, challenging. There are days where you question whether, you know, the the audience re- insistence on a, you know, day to day, every single night, you know, operation that brings to the table art house cinema in a city like Dubai when you're competing, you know, for eyeballs and attention spans and, you know, consumption habits and all sorts of aspirations, uh, you know, is the right thing to do. There, the dark night of the soul uh, sort of, you know, arc that you have to go through. But I think every 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 con concept is like that every independent concept is like that the beauty of, of being an entrepreneur at least for me is uh, is the impact i can have on, on 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 x amount of people and eventually across the globe with with me being i don't know sitting in the cinema you've been listening to tales of the trade with me chirag desai our producer is gaya our intern is abhishek wenkara subramanian and original music for the show was composed by Reiner Erlings. We hope you've enjoyed this mini summer season showcasing startup stories in Dubai and making an impact in their respective industries. And for those of you who want just a little bit more, we'll be sharing a special bonus episode in a couple of weeks with some of the discussions around how each of the startups view the future of the industries they're trying to disrupt. So we hope you'll pull up a chair and join the conversation. We'll see you then.